seen the new film recently out, directed by John Stewart, called Rosewater. Have you seen it? Uh, it's really intense. Um, the main character and the story of his life is based on the book, And Then They Came For Me, is Mazar Bahari. He's a reporter for Newsweek, and he goes home to Iran to report on the elections. He gets jailed while he's there, and jailed for reporting, for hanging out with some of those who were on the wrong side of the elections. In each scene of the movie, as he's jailed and wears a blindfold and is in solitary confinement, I'm wondering, when are they going to kill him? And all I want is for peace. All this conflict, all this warring, all this violence to just be done. He captures a scene of some of the protests in the streets. A, a, a man is climbing up on a fence, threatening the, the barricade of some important building, and he's shot down right there, just climbing up before he's done anything, presumably with no weapon. Shot and killed. I just want there to be peace. But do I want that kind of peace? The kind of peace that ends struggle and conflict? What if I never had conflict within about whether I'm doing the right or the wrong? What if I never had a struggle for a path this way or a path that way in my heart, in my soul, in my mind? What if we never had struggles in relationships? And we do, don't we? Where to go on vacation, whether to help this kid or not, whether to help this kid or that kid. <laughs> well, I know you're thinking of those struggles, right? <laughs> what if we never had those struggles? What if we never had to wrestle together to find out what our priorities are in our relationships? Would the love grow? Would it deepen? Those conflicts in business between, you know, the bottom line and taking care of our employees. Or care for creation versus maintaining the quality of our product. Competition with the outside world and paying attention to our bottom line. There's always struggle. Just look at Congress. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> um, within nations, among nations, peace in the world, wars never end, do they? We always have conflicts erupting. And why can't there just be peace? Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but to bring a sword. And then at the same time, he said, my peace I leave with you, peace that passes all understanding. I wrestled this week to come to an understanding of the biblical understanding of peace. Frederick Buechner, Presbyterian minister and writer, says this about peace. Peace has come to mean the time when there aren't any wars or even when there aren't any major wars. Beggars can't be choosers. We, most of us, settle for that. But in Hebrew, peace, or the word is actually shalom, means fullness means having everything you need to be holy and happily yourself. He explains the contradiction between Jesus' two statements this 
way. He says it's resolved when you realize that for Jesus, peace seems to have meant not the absence of struggle, but the presence of love. When you write, Professor of Theology at Creighton University in Omaha says this about peace. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but comes from holding together in love all the paradoxes of human experience. Jesus' way of peace was not to choose the strongest side and hope they would come out the winner, or to withdraw from the world, to ignore the conflict. Jesus' way of peace was to engage the world, to actively engage, to focus on his call, to focus on his way of peace. And Wendy goes on to say that the resurrection is God's sign that Jesus' way of peace was divinely sanctioned over the way of violence which God decried. Now in the, in the Gospel of John, we see these two views of peace. So John the Baptist he calls Jesus the Lamb of God. And in the mind of the reader of that day, longing for, looking for peace, for an end to the violence of the oppressor, they would have heard that as the Lamb who reigns with God in the end times. John wrote about this vision in Revelation. The victorious Lamb some churches have it on their window in stained glass. It's a little ironic to see a lamb with a sword. But that's what many readers would have heard. John the Baptist also says that the dove was the symbol that the Spirit came upon Jesus. The dove, for that early reader, would have been connected to the sacrifice, not even of the lamb, but the sacrifice of the poor person who came to the temple needing to be forgiven, needing to offer a sacrifice, but can't afford the preferred lamb. And then if you read the story of Jesus told by John, the gospel writer, this view of Jesus is carried throughout the story. The dove descends on Jesus. When Jesus comes into the city of Jerusalem from the opposite side of the city as the ruler of Jerusalem who comes in on a war horse, Remember the story? Jesus comes in on a donkey, an animal of peace. And then, Jesus is crucified when? At precisely the moment that the Passover lamb is sacrificed in the temple. Angel of death. 
death will pass over and you will be released from your bondage. This is what the Jews celebrate today, yet, in the season of Passover. <clears throat> the lamb is slain as a release from bondage, the bondage of death and enslavement. Now, we each have our bondage, right? We each have those things that enslave us, that compel us, that keep us from living free. During this time of the year, it seems most profound, that anxiety about whether we'll get it all done and whether we'll do it right and whether we're at the right parties and baking the right stuff and decorating our house better than the neighbors and all those things that preoccupy us. You have your Christmas shopping done? Yeah. <laughs> There's an anxiety that we feel throughout our lives, an anxiety, a, a paranoia perhaps? Well, you know what the opposite of paranoia is in the Greek? It's metanoia. It's what John calls for. Repent. Turn around. Change your focus. Don't be paranoid. Hit your focus back on your call, on your path, on what Jesus asks of you, on God's love for you. Forget about all that stuff that enslaves you, that holds you captive. Repent. Let go. Receive God's love and forgiveness. Feel God's peace. The story about the fierce warriors told by Pedro Pablo San Cristan. It's a story about Jerry, the most fierce warrior in the kingdom. Jerry's arrows never missed. The important tasks, being the sniper of the day, the important kills were given to Jerry. And he spent his days on his horse with his quiver full of arrows, following the ruler's command, killing those who were evil in the kingdom. One day, as he was plundering a palace, he came across some gleaming, shining arrows. He thought, these will come in handy one day. And sure enough, soon, the ruler commanded, kill the princess of that ruler. She alone remains. And so Jerry set off to find the princess, his eagle eyes looking, searching. And as always, he got behind the bush and he waited. What he didn't know was that in his quiver there had been this conversation going on between the old arrows and the new arrows. The new gleaming, shiny arrows had been watching and said, how? How can we do what he does? They were used to the games of the princess, the sport of the hunt. They were not used to kill or killing. And the old arrow said, Give it up. This is what we've been doing <coughs> our whole careers. But as the kid, as the, as the warrior kid, waiting for the princess, he thought, this is the time to use one of my new gleaming arrows. And the arrows had hatched a plan. So he pulled one out of his quiver. He lined it up in his bow. He waited for just the right moment. He pulled back. He let it go right at the princess's heart. And then all of a sudden, the flight path of the arrow wavered in a magical kind of way. And it landed in the middle of a beautiful bed of flowers. As Jerry went to get the stupid arrow, he knelt down and discovered and the fragrance of those flowers was amazing. 
He went after the princess. He pulled out another of those gleaming arrows. He pulled it back. He aimed, ready to shoot the princess through the heart. He let go. And this arrow, too, took a strange flight path and landed in a tree from which came the joyful song of birds. And as Jerry went to get the arrow, he was befuddled. What of these silly arrows? He took one more out. He aimed and he shot, and again, a strange, magical flight path this arrow took, this time landing at the feet of the princess. And as he chased down that silly arrow, he could see her baby and her kindness and her gentleness. And he said, what has my life been about? He gave up his life of killing for the ruler. He renounced all that he had done. He turned his efforts over to creating beauty and love in the world. He changed his focus. <clears throat> he became a peacemaker. I'm not saying it's easy to stay focused on that which is important. But I am saying it will help us to have the peace that God offers us. We do it in one way by coming to this table. Simple things like a bread and cup, the smell of cookies fresh out of the oven. Simple things like giving thanks for this community of folks, for those we will see at Christmas time for those for whom we buy gifts. Simple things. The hand of a child wrapped in the hand of a grandparent. The snow gently falling, hopefully, in the lights of Christmas. <laughs> 